Brutally Speaking podcast is proudly sponsored by Rockabilia.com. For over 30 years, Rockabilia has been the go-to destination for all things band merch. With over 500,000 items in their online store and collaborations with today's hottest bands, you're sure to find something you love. Use our code BREW10 at checkout and take 10% off your total order. So go pick up your favorite new piece of merch now over at rockabilia.com. Now, on to the show. People say you have to have a lot of passion for what you're doing. This rings true because it's so hard that if you don't, any rational person would give up. It's really hard, and you have to do it over a sustained period of time. So if you don't love it, and if you're not having fun doing it, What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Brutally Speaking Podcast. I am your host, John, and this episode's guest is Brian, the vocalist of Fame on Fire. Their latest album, Death Card, is out now. Go pick it up, stream it, whatever it is that you do, go do such. Um, was really looking forward to talking to Brian. Uh, he was a, a recent-ish guest on the Drinks with Johnny podcast, and I uh, was really looking forward to chatting with him and kind of going over sort of the concept of the album with the tarot card sort of like the template of the narrative of the the album from the you know the lyrical standpoint um and obviously in my interactions with those and just kind of even thinking about how does someone navigate kind of uh the journey i guess even to that cuz i know and i can't remember if i said it in this interview but um i know when i was going to do it for the first time i was talking with my wife and she was making a comment about what was my trepidation of not doing it and I was like I guess I'm just afraid of what information I'll get which I guess that's really looking back um it's really just kind of dealing with the unknown uh we don't really like necessarily dealing with the unknown we like to have answers and be prepared or as prepared as possible uh for a lot of these things so I think in the grand scheme of things it's scary uh when you don't know what it is and and to kind of be tapping into something that's I would say by and large throughout most of our existence, you're taught that it's scary. You know, it's in horror movies and it's, you know, sketchy people do it and all these kind of things. So, you know, I guess it's just kind of one of those things. It's it's almost honestly now I'm thinking about it sitting here. It's, it's kind of like how it has been to overcorrect the the narrative culturally of, of weed. I mean, the first time I went to a dispensary in, you know, was it Oregon I can't remember if it was Oregon or if it was uh, Colorado, one or the other. Um, maybe both. I think I actually hit up both within a few months of uh, them being legal in both those states. But I was going to say, like, the first time I walked in, like, I felt like I was doing something wrong. I was waiting for someone at any moment to be like, ah, we got you. And obviously that's not how it is, but that's how I felt in the moment. Um, and I would say maybe there's a little bit of that as well as to why, like, I – in my dealings with, you know, having my cards read, I was a little trepidatious in seeking it out. But I guess it's also like therapy where, like I said in the thing, where sometimes the information you get aligns with information or something you've already been thinking. So it kind of reinforces you to do something and kind of gives you that permission. But it is a little bit scary. Uh, and I think it's an interesting, like I said, interesting concept for kind of basing the lyrics uh, around a record of. So I was very interested in talking to Brian and uh, apologies for getting this episode out and actually the last week or so of the podcast uh, real quickly. Um, I don't know what's going on. Um, legitimately, I've Googled it. There's no there's no like this version of the software you're using is, you know, got a bug and it's got to be fixed. But uh, my thing that I used to make the movie versions, like the video versions of the podcast, just like was not working for last week's episode with Cole from Trench. Um, so then I had to like try to figure out a way to make it again without it. But then it just kept, you know, making it a 12 second video and like I could not figure it out. Then I went to do all of this that I'm currently doing right now, and then GarageBand just shit the bed. And so it has been a real clusterfuck to try to get all my stuff that I normally do week in and week out to get it to work, and now it's not the way that I want to. So it's been a bit of a struggle over here. Uh, slowly looks like I'm getting everything back to working order. And uh, beyond that, celebrated my 40th. Um, so went to some shows, hung out with friends. So the motivation to to kind of 
uh, want to sit behind a computer when I had other things to do uh, was not as strong this week. So I figured it's fine. I have been pretty much consistently putting things out for eight years now and almost 500 episodes, uh, getting something out a day later or posting about it a couple of days later, a week later, whatever it happens to be. It's not the end of the world. And in the grand scheme of things, just roll with the punches. Metaphor for life. All that said, let's get into my conversation with Brian. I'll talk to you all on the other side of it. So it's funny, I was actually uh, texting with Sam from uh, Drinks with Johnny uh, a little bit ago, and I was like, I think we need to coordinate our, our guest schedule a little better, because uh, it seems like you are literally putting out the thing I'm about to do. <laughs> yeah, so. I, dude, I've been doing so many of these, so it's just, it's going to happen. Don't worry. I no, for sure. Answers. I give different answers every time, so no one knows what the truth is. <laughs> you must be real fun to date, then. <laughs> oh, dude, it's the best. <laughs> Um, something I kind of wanted to, to, to hop into a little bit, uh, just because I, I feel it really interesting that this has become, uh, a lot more present in my life and a lot of the conversations I do on here, but, um, you know, the new album, um, the death card. And essentially it was funny because when the singles were coming out and obviously like the, the secondary titles, uh, and whatever that's technically called, not the parentheses, but whatever that is, um, you know, I was kind of wondering how those tied in because, you know, some bands are doing that a little bit more where there's like a secondary title uh, that's coming out with these songs. When the album was named and it was going to be revealed that it's the death card, it was like, oh, these are tarot cards. Now it starts making more sense to me. Yeah. So uh, having had my cards read for the first time about a year ago, how how has that theme, how have tarot cards or whatever, how have they kind of... Uh, inspired you or what did they reveal because i feel like there's probably a lot uh, especially with the cards and how they identify with the song titles and so forth probably a lot uh going on with that theme on this record yeah the the whole record is based around the uh, tarot card theme um as far as me and what they mean i take everything with like the biggest grain of salt ever because i've had my i've had my uh tarot cards read to me a few times and it's been different every time uh last time they got read to me it wasn't a great thing but I was like, fuck mm. this shit. I'm still kind of like, fuck this shit. Um, mm. <laughs> because it wasn't, it was, it wasn't like necessarily bad, but it wasn't great. But like everybody else got great cards and I got shit cards. I was like, okay, well, this is fucking stupid. Um, so can I ask you, I what been, do you mean by like, what do you mean by shit? Like, how were they shit to you? Uh, it wasn't positive things. Like, Everybody got their cards read in there and everyone's like, oh, you guys are doing the right thing. You guys are on the right path. And then I get my cards read to me. It's like, you're a fuck up and i'm like that's mm. stupid and i'm like this is <laughs> so do you um, do you think if they would have been positive that you would have actually accepted that as as a reality of sorts probably not probably not okay i i I'm, uh, i don't believe in really any of the bullshit to be honest and not that it's like you know if, if someone really loves it that's fine but i don't believe in the uh whole uh astrology thing i think that's all bs um i don't believe in spirits i don't believe in really any of that like if there's no science behind it i don't believe it like that's mm. kind of where i stand with it um so i mean some things are fun to do like it's you know it's, it's always fun when a girl goes hey what's your sign and you're like oh <laughs> i'm a cancer and she's like oh i can trust you it's like no the fuck you can't <laughs> like so i don't know like, it's fun. It is a lot of fun, and it's very cool. Um, I'll get back on track, though, with what it means to this album, though. With the album and the writing of it, like, we thought that Tarot Cards was a really cool theme, and we wanted mm -hmm. to do it very right. Um, I may not necessarily believe in all of it, um, but I also don't believe in fucking, you know, killing people either, and people talk about that shit all the time. Um, so i we wanted it to be a really cool theme behind the album and we needed it to really make sense so every song has a tarot card related to it and that song is about that tarot card but from my perspective 
So it isn't mm. like, you know, I was just like, oh, that's a cool card name. I'm going to write a song about that. Because if every song was a cool card name, we wouldn't have a song called, you know, Ten of Swords. Um, right. Because that's not that cool of a card name. Um, every song needs to pertain to a specific card. And the lyrics need to match the card. And the lyrics need to match me and what I'm feeling, my vibe. So... You know, there's kind of like three things that need to line up here. And if they don't line up, then we have to rework it. So that's the whole thing. Well, it's kind of, what's kind of interesting about that and why I was kind of intrigued because I had found, and I understand like the person I had do it, you know, it's probably not how everyone does it when they go to somebody or whatever. Um, this person was kind of new in their journey through uh, more reading. And so it was interesting was, the way she did it was she read my cards, grabbed another deck, and then kind of gave me a, a secondary reading just to kind of see how maybe the first deck maybe didn't actually align or whatever. But the thing that I thought was really interesting that she didn't, and it's really been a, a thing I've tried to be more mindful of because I think it's a way to kind of approach life a little bit better is kind of have a different intent, be more positive and impact or intent. And so when she gave me cards and they were upside down and it was like, oh, these are typically these would be deemed as bad. Like these are not good cards to get, you know, the king upside right. down or whatever, things like that. Those are, those and so, are the yeah. Yeah. And so the way that she had kind of explained it to me was really interesting. She goes, I don't necessarily view this as a bad thing. I view it as something you just haven't gained the, the proper knowledge and, and utilization of at this point for, in your life. So at some point, this upside down thing may be turned back upside up, right side up when you've gained that knowledge in life. And so to me, I always think it's kind of interesting just to see how people's, uh how they experience you know getting their cards read because i was a little terrified for a, a while because it's like what do i do with this information like what if it's good what if it's bad what if it's whatever and i think that that was kind of an interesting stance on it was just like uh, the trepidation of doing it and then once you kind of do it it kind of gives you an interesting perspective that you can choose to take however you want to i think for me the bigger thing was that i was like this feels a lot like therapy in a way just instead of kind of asking open-ended questions to get you to reveal something these things kind of go and then it starts the, the conversation of sorts as to what does it mean to you how is it interpreted and then how do you use it in your life going forward so to me i just kind of thought that that was an interesting way to when coming up with an album when writing an album i should say from your perspective the the vast possibilities of where you could take it and where the inspiration comes from and how focused you are on trying to do something and, and make it kind of mirror these other things. So it was a thing where I was like, it was it a very freeing process or was it a very limiting process to a degree? Oh, it's it's a it's a bit of both. Um, it it it's like it's cool that we had a concept laid out, but it was very limiting because in a way that everything needs to work together and if it doesn't work together like it it's not doing it justice to be honest like because that's one thing we didn't want to be disrespectful to the entire you know um tarot card community what are they called the arcanas whatever whatever it's called yeah um, yeah we want we didn't want to be disrespectful towards that kind of community we didn't want to just we didn't want to use it as so much of a gimmick it is a bit of a gimmick but it's not we want to use it more as a concept right and i mean the whole the whole tarot card thing is a concept within itself um just as time itself is right so we wanted to use this as a concept and we needed just everything to make sense and it did limit us in a sense of you know how what can i talk about well if we're going to write about the fool we need the song to make sense with that card because i really like that card and so it's like okay well now i know what my lyrics are going to be about but like which gives me a direction to go but it's like how do I relate this to me? Which made it a little complicated sometimes. Hmm. You know, it was kind of interesting leading up to this. You know, I was like kind of trying to find and pull weird things that you guys have all put out and find a way to talk about it a little bit more in depth. And, you know, again, this might be kind of a, a therapy brain. This might be kind of just, you know, having a lot of people in the touring industry and just kind of seeing how different facets of things, you know, sometimes you manifest the thing you want, but it's not how you envisioned it to be. And you guys have made a post uh, back in February on on your Facebook kind of talking about, you know, you you search out for the dream. You know, you want to be in a band, you want to get signed, you want to do the tours, you want to do all these things. But it sort of comes at a cost that maybe you're not realizing what it is that you're paying uh, at the time. And so it was oh, kind of yeah. interesting 
thinking about that because I feel like, you know, you're one that in this past year I've gotten Octane for my wife because we got a vehicle that can have it. And it was a thing where it's like hearing you guys constantly on Octane and so forth. So kind of introducing me to this this Octane world I hear so much about and like what Sirius does for a lot of bands and seeing, you know, my friends who go see these bands and go see like you guys who are usually first, second or third on, you know, a package tour and just seeing like the quick quote unquote rise. And so to me, it was a thing where, you know, I don't feel like traditional radio is, is such a thing anymore. And I feel like XM has kind of replaced that. Um, yeah. But what is your experience kind of been with all this? Because I feel like you're the success of the band on more of a mainstream level has kind of been really quote unquote quick over the last year, even though I know the band has been around for much longer than that. So it's yeah. that classic, you know, you're an overnight success 10 years in the making. <laughs> Literally that's, that's how it feels. Um, yeah. Everything feels quick. Everything feels slow at the same time, but like, yeah, like, like you were saying, um, nightmare dude, it, it, that's the song that's about like, like a, a, it kind of is like fucking signing your soul away to the devil in a sense, because it's like, we knew that this is what we always wanted to do. Um, and then, you know, while doing it, we went like, we went three years nonstop. We were like constantly touring. We were always gone. And if we were home, you know, we were going, we were never truly home in a sense. We, we would, we would be home for a week and then we would fly out, you know, for three days and then we would come home for like four days and then fly back out again it's just like it was constant and it like it wears on your soul and the thing is is that like when you get you get like this weird ego too because it's like you get praised by people for doing the thing that you love and like this is amazing but the moment those cheers stop the moment those people are no longer there you almost feel like you have no value to offer anybody about anything like you become very much a shell of yourself and that's like kind of like the dark side of it all that we didn't realize going into this. It's like, like looking back, like when we were when we were working on the death card. I was not, I was not in a happy place. I was like, this fucking sucks. I don't want to be here. I don't want to be in Los Angeles. I don't. I was like, I just want to be like, I just want to be like trying to find myself again, like get back to like who I am. And so like, eventually I did. You know, eventually we had time <laughs> off. But it's like while making that record, dude, just shit was shit was tough. And so like that's why like nightmares like you know, the perfect song to come out of the gate with because it's like, it's so hard. This world, like, this is what we dreamed of and we were living in our dream and we are so fucking grateful, but it's like, it's so, it gets really hard at times, especially when you get lost in your own sauce, to be honest. Well, I feel like that's, I feel like that's like kind of the interesting thing. And, and, you know, maybe it's a little bit of a byproduct of just recently watching that uh, Nickelback documentary they put out, like the most hated or least hated or whatever that it was called. But, you know, it was interesting to, to see this band that like is huge. And like, it starts with everyone being like, no one gave a shit about us. No one cared. Like we did it for us. And then we kind of had some people fall by the wayside because it, we took it so seriously and knew that it was what we wanted to do. Some people just can't hang like that. But to like, I don't know, it's just it's so interesting to see when it starts happening that it almost becomes this double edged sword of sorts where it's like, it's great finally having people know your song to sing along to the songs. It's what you've always wanted. But mm -hmm. like you said, it comes at such a price that it's just like, is it worth it in the end? And how do you navigate all that? And to me, being fascinated with with how people traverse life and, and the different obstacles that they are all we all face, some very similar, some not that it's like. I feel like there's got to be kind of a weird thing about like, you know, this album you weren't really stoked on making, but now it's, it's kind of bringing you the success that I think everyone kind of wants. So it's kind of like, how do you navigate that going the fuck? This is now the next 18, maybe 22 months of my life. Is this, yeah. this record? It is. Yeah. That was another thing. It's like, we're, we're like, you know, when you make like one record, you're like, how the fuck do I top this? And then we make another record. We're like, okay, how the fuck do I top this? And I, and I truly do believe in, in like my soul with like everything is that this record is like very special. Like this record is the record that is going to take us to new heights. And this is the record that I feel like we are going to be defined by in a sense now, which I'm very happy for, but it's like, while making this record, I could never tell you that. Wow, while making this record, I was like, what the f I was like, I was like, I hate this, I hate that, I hate all of you guys. Like, fuck this shit. I don't want to be in the studio. Like, I was, you know, I was not a pleasant person to be around. 
you know, but like, it's like, I feel like it honestly kind of reflects like what kind of headspace I was in while making this record in like, in a good way, because like, you know, now I'm on the other side of it. Now I've like done a lot of, you know, you know, we had, we finally had like a five month off period, which was insane, which reset my entire life. Um, we finally like, you know, I finally got better with communicating with people. You know, there's a lot of things that mm. like, you know, <laughs> we've, we've done therapy, you know, we've done group therapy too. But, like there's been like a lot of things that we've gone through as a band and individually to like get to the point that we're at. But it's like, it's like, you know, you, once you're out of it though, and you probably know this, once you're out of the darkness, you can look back and be like, wow, that was fucking dark. I mean, I've been trying not to make this all that this show has become over the last like month, but it's been interesting because I've been on a reverse uh, chronological journey. So I had foot surgery literally a week ago, yesterday or tomorrow. Um, and so the month leading up to it, like the episode I just put out was me finding out I was going to have the surgery. I put that out, recorded the intro outro the day before my surgery. So it's been very wow. weird kind of chronologically going back and forth through this, this journey. Right. And it's been a thing where like, I mean, as I'm literally sitting in the most awkward position right now, so I can do this in some sort of capacity, um, that it's been so hard, like the last few days of just like my sleep schedule is all fucked up. Like I'm really ang like kind of angry at things, but also at nothing because it's like no one did this to me. So it's like right. you're just angry because I'm inconvenienced and I can't do things the way I want to. My sleep schedule is all fucked up. Like I'm awake when everyone's sleeping and even with having friends like on the West Coast and shit, it's like they're busy. So I'm like. Fuck, man. From like 1130 to like 630 in the morning, like when I'm it's like the quietest, it's also the loudest in my head. And it's just like I think to myself and I have to be reminded at times that this is a momentary setback that in the grand scheme of like life and everything, it, it's like a blip. But like right now, because it's all encompassing, it feels like it is in, in the, like taking over everything in my life that it's like hard not to just be mad. So it's interesting to hear you kind of say like, when I was doing this record, I felt this way because that's how I feel about a lot of things right now. And I'm trying not to be uh, that way because that's not really my personality. But I think there is something to kind of sometimes I think like I've kind of come to this conclusion recently uh, listening to certain bands that I'm just kind of gravitating toward right now where sometimes I think you need to let yourself wallow in something and really feel awful to really oh, yeah. kind of understand like when you're on the other side of it, you're like. I don't fucking feel like that right now. So that's a win. Yeah, yeah it, it's all temporary and I'm happy your surgery was successful. But yeah, it's kinda, yeah, same thing. I, I know all I do. I know all the shit of like when we got back from Japan recently, my schedule was fucked up for a week and I was just like, I knew I would be okay. But like, you know, like I was definitely like grumpy. Like I was never like angry and never felt like I was in a truly dark place or anything like that. But like, I was just like, yeah, I was just like, oh my God, this is so fucking annoying. I can't. I can't sleep right. Like, I was like, I need a fucking sleep study. I still think I need a sleep study because I, I, I sleep like absolute dog shit. Um, <laughs> I've, well, actually, I, to that question, because someone asked me this the other day and it really made me kind of take pause and, and reflect. So I'll ask you the same thing. They asked me, how often do you sleep? And I go, like, what is your good sleep like? And I go, well, what do you deem good sleep? So I guess I'll prose that to you first of all. Like, how much do you sleep in a day? And uh, and then I'll see if your answer sort of matches mine. Um, if I get good sleep, it's around six and a half to seven hours. Oh wow! Like that's that's good, that's good sleep. <laughs> that's good. <laughs> yeah, but like, there's like, it's not consistent though, which is the issue. Because mm. like, I will I will get six and a half seven hours some days, and then some days I will get three, <laughs> and I'm like. And I'm like, this sucks. And I also have a, I have a ring that I have a ring on that tracks me. So, mm. so like I, I, you know, I'm pretty aware of like when, when I'm good, when I'm not. Like last night, I probably got like four. Okay, because so I was gonna say, typically, I would say for me, I, I usually quote unquote function on like three, maybe four. But I think that like it's my three to four is like what some people are like in that six to seven range where it's like that's their good. Mine's if I get three to four like quality, really good sleep, I can function like most of a day at a higher level than I think a lot of other people. But it's funny when people kind of ask you that it's well, what's good sleep and what do you like? Because I can function on this and I have and sustained it for a very yeah, long yeah. period of time. It's just what I know. But I always think it's kind of interesting to see and kind of break down like what 
how people's habits and patterns dictate them. So to me, I would say, do you find that you're actually more functional when you have three or four versus six or seven? Oh, fucking six or seven. I'm, I'm also, I'm insane when I get eight. <laughs> fucking, I'm, I'm on top of my game when I get eight. Like, on I don't tour, even know what that would like, be like. <laughs> here's the funny thing. I don't know. I don't know how much I actually sleep on tour because, like, you know, sometimes like the vans or the bandwagons can be really bumpy. A bus is not bumpy. A bus is glorious to sleep on. Um, but sometimes it'll be really bumpy, and uh, it's like it's like you're literally riding in the back of a truck. And um, sometimes I wonder how much sleep am I actually getting because, like, you know, I'll be in my bunk for like fucking ten hours but I don't think I got 10 hours of sleep. There's definitely some times <laughs> in the middle of the night where I've woken up and like, I'm like, I'm getting hang time. I'm in air. You know, if any other bands watching this that have torn in a bandwagon, you're going through like Texas. And like, <laughs> I swear to God, I've woken up in air. I've woken up in air. And I'm like, just touching my sandwich. Like, what the fuck? And I come back down. I was like, that's insane. Now I want to know how much zero gravity sleep you're getting. <laughs> yeah. Oh, dude, that'd be sick. I feel like it would be, but then I all, yeah, I feel like that'd be sweet, but I also feel like it would be the same thing as like being in a soundproof area where you're just like, I need something to like kind of balance me out. Yeah. No, I, maybe. Yes. You're probably right. But then again, yeah. we don't know. No. I mean, you could take one of those weird uh, planes where you spend probably a shitload of money to experience zero G for like three or four minutes. Yeah. We can take a quick nap. Yeah, just, yeah, just on the way down, do it right before I'm going. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, you know, kind of wrapping up because we got a couple more minutes left with you before you got to go. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the thing that's also kind of interesting that I like to kind of ask people because, you know, the record's just under a month away as of when we're doing this chat. Um, you know, the thing is, is for however many months to a year that this record has been sitting in your as a, like a Dropbox file or something uh, after the mixing and mastering, you know, it's about to not be yours anymore. What is what is the thing you're most looking forward to everyone finally hearing on this that they haven't? And do you have maybe a uh, album release day or, you know, drop day, like superstition that you do? Um, well, I'll answer the first one. The first thing I'm really looking forward to people hearing, like this one of the, I have about two, I have two songs. Um, I love, I love all of them. And I think they're super unique and super cool. But like the songs that aren't out yet, I'm really excited for everybody to hear Chains because um, mm. Chains is fucking awesome. Um, but I'm also excited for people to hear Lie to Me because, like, that's a song mm. that, like, is, like, very close to me and pretty crazy. And so I'm excited for people to hear that song because um, it is, like, it is, like, a true ballad kind of song and we've never really done one of those. So that's what I'm really looking forward to. And as far as release day superstitions, I literally have nothing. I just need to make a billion fucking TikToks and, <laughs> and fake sing in front of a microphone and ask people if they are feeling my vibe, dude. Yeah. There's a friend of mine, Maddie, that does a lot of those isolated vocal video things from oh. Memphis May Fire, now in Berlin. And I'm always just like, the amount of these that you probably crank out in a day, like changing your outfit, doing all the things. And even, oh, you know, dude. and I know from having the, one of the guys uh, talking about how having Maddie come in, knowing more of the social media world uh, in Amberlynn has kind of helped them engage in a different audience than they've had in recent years. But it's also a thing where he's like, it's like a whole nother fucking job, man. Like I got to do these reels and do these things. And I, I don't want to do this all the time. So <laughs> it's so annoying, but like as the singer, it's like kind of our fucking job. Um, but luckily we have, I film, I'll film a lot of things and then we'll have, um, our drummer who is a, like he works as a videographer. So like I send him mm -hmm. over the footage and he edits it and he'll post them. He's the one that's doing all the posting and I don't do any other posting. Cause like, I cannot, I can't be fucking filming it, writing and posting. I'm not doing all that <laughs> shit. And also doing, don't explain why you're... doing 8 billion interviews in a day. Like I, I can't do all of it. So it's like. Well, I was going to say, also, that's why also, your Instagram page Mullen. is now like 12, 12 posts. <laughs> dude, yeah. Dude, shout out Melanie Mullins, though. What a, what a nice dude. Yeah. One of the nicest people I've ever met. Definitely. Southern hospitality to a, to a T from a, a guy from the Pacific Northwest. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, he's from Seattle, right? Yeah, he's from Seattle, but lives down in, uh, down in Nash or Nashville adjacent out in Spring Hill. Mm -hmm. 
that's, so that's where everyone's moving now. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. So I've been told. Well, I mean, you're a Florida boy, so I mean, any any moves to to go south or go out west, or you stay in staying where you put? Uh, I really enjoy living in Central Florida. I I got mm. I got I don't want to go. If I did go somewhere though, it'd probably be Nashville, but I don't want to. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, last question for you: Where can anyone find you or anything you would like to plug online? Um, you can find me uh, personally at I Miss the O'Brien on Instagram. Uh, you can find my band Fame on Fire on Instagram. Um, and if you want to find anything like tour dates or anything, FameOnFireBand.com. We are going out with Wage War in late September, so grab your tickets to that and uh, it's party. Yeah, I love the. I assume the Instagram handle is a reference to Kanye. You know, Good I miss job. the old Kanye. Yeah. Well oh yeah. Done. Oh, huge Kanye fan. <laughs> Not everybody knows that. Not everybody knows that. But yeah, that's a. That's a. I miss the old Kanye. <laughs> Kanye. Yep. Yep. That's that I used. I used to think I was Kanye. <laughs> yep. Yep. That's the, that's the reference. Yeah. yeah a lot absolutely. Of people will go. Will well, go. So, do you miss the old Brian? And I'm like, yeah. He was. He was. He didn't give a fuck. <laughs> yeah yeah i'm sure not a lot of people in this scene probably obviously are very aware of kanye beyond, as far as the music maybe in personality and so forth but actual music uh but life of pablo uh, was one of the greatest albums of like all time oh, yeah, in his no, discography it's such, a, it's, it's such a weird album dude like I, I like really dig weird albums when you get into the weirdness of them like i like them like even like the new event sampled album, it's weird as fuck, but I really like it. <laughs> I think for me that Kanye thing, and this will be my last comment to you, but that was one where when I saw that tour, I realized for the first time some things that are done on a record aren't meant for a record. They're meant for the live experience. You just don't realize that until you go see it live. And seeing some of those songs on Pablo live, I was like, Oh, oh, this is a whole ass vibe live. Like on record, you're just like, eh. so, Yeah. I feel like you almost gotta like force feed it to yourself. You're like, and you'll understand it. Like, yeah, it, it takes. Yeah, people don't want to do that though. They don't want to earn it. <laughs> no, no, you. That's one you have to earn for sure. Yeah, but enjoy the rest of your day. Enjoy the rest of doing uh, however many uh, of these you have left to do. And uh, hopefully, I'll see you guys on the road. I think you're playing in Detroit and around my birthday in September. So I'll probably try to come you're out playing to that. Detroit September 28th. Come hang out. That is eight days after my 40th, so I will try if my foot allows me. Let's go. I'm seeing you have to enjoy the rest stage. of your day, man. You too, John. I'll see <laughs> you. Absolutely. See ya. So that was my conversation with Brian. want to thank him once again for taking the time to do a quick chat, uh, for kind of talking a little bit more about the experiences uh, that he has uh, and how he kind of came to writing for the new album. Uh, again, Death Card, out now. Um and it's interesting. It's been interesting to to be kind of on the other side of these things. You know, for a while, you know, these like Danny Wimmer festivals and, and all these kind of things would start coming through with bands that at the time I'm like, how are these bands like getting big? And kind of a weird one, honestly, was has been nothing more like looking back on nothing more's success. You know, it's based on songs and all that. But I remember when they came through to play like a a, a small theater here and sold it out. And, you know, a few years ago when I first met the guys, I remember thinking to myself, I was like, how does this band like play to a room this size? Like they're not like a, 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 you know, at the time the shows, the bands that were just coming through, like it wasn't like a Papa Roach who consistently had like early radio access. I'm still hearing on the radio. I'm still seeing them pushed on, you know, various people's socials and so forth. So to me, it was sort of this antiquated way of how I viewed how we take in music. And to me, it was, well, radio obviously is a thing. And, you know, seriously, and those things have been around for a very long time. You know, I just never had it. And so it became the thing over this last year where my wife and I now have it in our vehicles. It's really been interesting to see how you can almost track in real time what those kind of avenues are doing for bands. You know, I remember when Nightmare first came out with Fame on Fire and thinking, oh, that's a really catchy song. And then I would hear it. Then, you know, it was getting on biggins and, you know, then I just kind of see it a little more to where then, you know, some of the people in the circle of friends that do like shift rock and, you know, those kind of things and go to a lot of shows are like, oh, I saw this band with this person. And, you know, Fame on Fire has been one of those bands for the last little bit where people are like, oh, this is a band I'm really excited to see. This is a band you should check out. So it's really interesting to kind of see that happening like in real time 
because I don't feel like as I get older and how I take in my, my music and so forth, it's not necessarily the, the same avenues everyone else does. So it's interesting, like I said, to see a band kind of popping off, but popping off in 2024, like what that looks like. So it's been really interesting to kind of to see the growth of this band. And, and there's a couple episodes coming up uh, and, and have been coming out uh, with bands that are kind of newer and, and kind of a part of that, like octane, you know, seeing that serious kind of uh, rock metals world. And it's like I said, it's interesting. It's interesting to, to kind of see how this new system works. Um, so it's been really cool to kind of talk to some of these bands that I think are going to be sticking around for, for a while. And we're going to be, Possibly some of the newer headliners uh, in the next handful of years, you know, playing some of these rooms, you know, this fame on fire could be this could be the start of, you know, them becoming the headliner that plays, you know, two to twenty two hundred cap rooms and so forth. So always great to kind of dip your toes into to something else a little bit different uh, than maybe what you would expect from here. Um, but like I always say, I feel like you can kind of learn something from everybody, uh, if you just take the time and speaking of time, let's start wrapping up this episode. If you would like to keep up with fame on fire, like I said, in the intro, you go to fame on fire band.com. That's the landing page for everything. Otherwise you can find them on all the socials at fame on fire. Very, very gracious when bands or people are able to get the exact same name on everything. It makes it so easy. And if you'd like to keep up with Brian, you can find him on Instagram at I Miss the Old Brian. That was a fun little story about how he came up with that moniker for his Instagram. And if you'd like to keep up with him on Twitter, it's simple enough. It's just his name. Uh, I'm not entirely sure how to pronounce his last name. Uh, again, I talk about this all the time where vowels really throw me from living in the East Coast to now living here in the Midwest. Uh, so I'm not going to miss and mispronounce or butcher his last name. So uh, look in the show notes. Look at literally the show graphic. His name is spelled correctly. Uh, obviously, if you're listening, you probably know how to pronounce it. I'm just not going to butcher it. Uh, not even so. Then that way I don't have someone going, oh, well, you didn't know it's pronounced. And then give me a phonetic way of saying it. Uh, so I'm just not even going to do it. Uh, if you like people with the podcast, you can find us simple enough. Bruce Speak Pod on all your major social media platforms. Email me at brutallyspeaking at gmail.com. Uh, if you have any suggestions for guests or comments or anything like that you would like to make, rate, review, subscribe. You know why that is important. You hear every podcast ever say why. So just go ahead and do it if you are able to. And at the very least, please recommend to a friend. Uh, I've been getting a lot of that lately of people talking about specific episodes, how they've been sharing them with uh, friends and so forth. Uh, very recently, I actually had someone comment on the Jordan Buckley episode uh, saying that they have gone back and listened to it multiple times uh, because they pick out things in the in the conversation with Jordan. Um, so that is, that is why I do it. That is what gives me uh, a, a sense of pride, a sense of accomplishments, uh, and so forth. When obviously this thing that I do that I, I am passionate about, uh, that people get something out of it. So keep doing that. It is greatly appreciated. And for the brutally speaking podcast, I am John and I'll see you all next week where I have Alan Robert of life of agony. That was a really cool chat. Uh, we talk about uh, his graphic novel. We talk a little bit about horror stuff, some life of agony, you know, kind of do the thing that I do, or we kind of meander through a lot of talking points, but uh, it was a lot of fun talking with Alan. Looking forward to getting that one out to all of you. So I will see you all next week. Enjoy the rest of yours.